everyone we're recording uh halfway through our class sorry about that you haven't missed much just all of our introductions so you won't know anyone in the class if you're watching this um so anyways this number is here if you guys aren't seeing the course in iLearn it's probably not your fault or my fault it's you should just call the university and they'll forward you on to some iLearn people who can fix that for you all right so let's dive into our course all right let's start with our syllabus Notice here, if you click on the syllabus in iLearn, there's not really much here, okay? Uh, there's basically a list of all the assignments that are due in the course and when they're due. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that um, your assignments are weighted, okay? So 40% for assignments. That includes your reports, okay? So um, your participation in Slack is self-reported. And so that all ends up being 10% of your grade. And then your exams total up to 45% of your grade. I'm going to fix this. There, this isn't adding up to 100. So, um, but anyway, so you can see that over here. If you look at the detailed syllabus, though, this is where uh, my syllabus actually resides. Okay, and this is what I sent out the other day. Uh, here's our Zoom link for class every week. We go through our course objectives, uh, what we're going to be doing this course. Here's our textbook. If you guys want to buy it, you can. You don't have to. Uh, like I said, it is available free on iLearn. And what that looks like. If you go into modules and we just pick any given week, we'll just say week one. Uh, it says just week one, chapter one, reading, computing, or computer hardware. Um, did that open that up? Yeah, let me click on that again. Oh, there we go. So, it's basically like a big PDF of the chapter, okay? And some of these are actually nicer than the book because some of them are interactive. Um, and the book's black and white if you care about seeing the color of semiconductors. But, um, so yeah, so the book is available online each week. Some people like the paper copy. They can easily mark it up. I guess you could mark this up too if you threw it in a OneNote or something. But so yeah, that's your book. Uh, software that you need for this class. Uh, as far as programming goes, it's a pretty light class, okay? Uh, I recommend that you install Visual Studio Code or Sublime. I absolutely love both of these text editors. Um, I use Sublime for a number of years. There are a bunch though. If you like Google like top 100 text editors, you can see a full list of 100. <laughs> there are a lot of different text editors. Okay, uh, I will be using Visual Studio Code in all of our classes and a lot of my videos are in Sublime. So you, you can take your pick, they're both great. Uh, you do need Google Chrome. A lot of people are like, well, I like Firefox. You can still use Firefox, that's fine. But when you're running your programs in the browser, um, there's this amazing thing called developer tools over here. I'm sure you guys have seen it before if you like accidentally hit your keyboard and you're like, oh my heavens, what is all this stuff? Well, this is code similar to what you're going to write this semester, okay? And we're gonna work with these develop, it won't look like this, don't worry. Uh, but we're gonna write code similar to this this semester and I will be teaching you how to use these developer tools. So you do need Google Chrome. And then Slack, Slack is the last thing. So do download it. You can just access Slack and use the browser version, uh, but that has its limitations. You don't get notified if, if, if you're missing stuff on there. And if you have it downloaded um, on your iPhone or your Android device or and your computer, um, then you'll always get notifications. And if you post on the help channel, you'll see a response when it comes. And so I just recommend that you download it. Uh, and then if you haven't joined our Slack workspace, um, you just have to follow this link. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You'll create a little mini Slack account for our workspace. And so if you have multiple classes that each have Slack, you'll have to do it for each one where you make a little account, say what email you're gonna use and so forth. Uh, but once you get in there, here's what Slack looks like. Uh, we have our general channel, okay? Which is kind of where I'll post um, just things pertinent to our class as a whole. Um, we have our help channel, a random channel if you feel so inclined to post something random there. Help you can ask questions on. We'll have a discussion for each week. And so this week one discussion, a lot of people are, are going to be posting their personal introductions here. Um, and then we also have an extra credit channel. If someone helps you a lot in the help channel or something like that and you're like, dude, they deserve extra credit. They just help me for like an hour. Um, then just nominate them here and, and they'll get extra credit. Okay. Uh, down here, you can click on this little plus sign to send a direct message to anyone in the course, including me. 
Uh, you can also do groups. So if you ever had like a grading question and you wanted to include me, you could send it to Nicholas and to me um, and make like a little group with the three of us. So um, it's really nice. So any questions about Slack? Okay, sounds good. All right, time. I say I'll spend approximately 12 hours each week in this course. It totally depend, depends on you. Uh, it is a three credit course, so, so the university says nine to 12 hours. Um, if you have programming experience, this might be cut down to like five hours a week or even less, maybe a little more. Uh, if you don't have any experience and um, you know, you, you're, it, it, you might be closer to that nine, or nine to 12 hour range uh, but just be aware of that. Um, maybe this week really pay attention to how much time you're having to spend on your assignments this week. Um, and then just kind of plan accordingly for the rest of the semester. Now, with that said, week one is the lightest week in the entire semester. Um, so if you get used to this week and you're like, man, I only spent four hours on the class, just know that next week you'll probably have to spend like double. And so just plan accordingly. So uh, requirements, if you're gonna participate in our classes, I recommend a good headset. Uh, where to get help, okay? Everything else, else in this spreadsheet, you guys can read through. You'll see um, how we'll grade you on things, um, you know, where you'll land with, with your grade and how you'll be graded. We have extra credit, we have a Slack help channel like we just talked about, and then our spiritual messages. These are actually posted in iLearn. Um, so each week, if you click on the announcement, you'll see that there's a spiritual message in here, okay? And you get extra credit for just participating in that discussion on the announcement itself in Ireland. Okay. Um, late work policy, no late work is, is accepted. Um, basically, I just deduct 20% per day. So if you submit something five days late, you'll get zero on it. Um, but with that said, if we go up to our help document, I have two links right here, a video spreadsheet and a help document. We'll start with the help doc document because the video spreadsheet is in here too. Uh, I have a bunch of things in here to say where you should go if you need help, if you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling overwhelmed. Um, and this is kind of the order that I think is the most beneficial for you, okay? Uh, I learned course content, okay? If you're having, if you're struggling, go look in the book, okay? Look in the book. There's lots of examples for each chapter in the book. And so I would say just look in the book and see if you can find an example similar to what you're having to do. The video spreadsheet. Uh, if you look at the video spreadsheet, you will see that there are about a billion videos in here and a lot of them are locked, okay? Um, the, this lecture link right here will be replaced. I'm gonna take these out. These are from last semester, uh, but I will put the lecture from every Monday morning in here that we do. Uh, but you do have access to the slides I'm gonna use, though that's just fine. Uh, I have exam preparation videos and then walkthroughs. So I go through like every single answer of the exam. Uh, and then same thing with our assignments, okay? So next week, on the 21st, so a week from today, your intro video for this week to prove assignment will become available to you, okay? You can watch it if you don't understand anything about the instructions. If you look at the instructions and you're like, I know what I'm gonna do, then don't watch it. Some of these though, I'm like, you know, this is a pretty tough assignment, maybe I'll write a couple lines of code for them or give them a couple tips or say where I would start just to kind of help guide you through that. Then this walkthrough video comes out a week later, all right, that is two days after your assignment is due. So if you really wanted to, if you're struggling with an assignment and you're like, you know what, I can't do this, I can't figure it out, I'm gonna wait till Monday morning when his walkthrough video becomes available and I'll finish it up by noon and then I'll get 60% on it. That's totally fine. You guys can use my walkthrough videos to help you if you haven't finished an assignment. Um, that's just part of the reason why I say that you get docked 20% per day is because the solution is posted like a minute after it's due. So, well, I guess in this case, it's, it's like 24 hours after it's due, but. Um, so these are all here. These programming exercises, notice they're not locked. You can click on them right now if you want to watch them. They're just YouTube videos that I've made. Uh, and they're very similar to your, um, your assignments. If we look at chapter one, uh, at the end, we have a bunch of review questions. I guess chapter two would be a better example. I'll just look at chapter four. Um, so if I click on a chapter here, let's see, chapter four, JavaScript basics. We open up the chapter. You can see we have a bunch of examples of code here. That's why I'm like, go to the book if you're struggling with something because these are fully functional programs. Um, but at the bottom, let's see, we have programming assignments. And there are like four down here, okay? And you will have to do one or two of these each week 
but then there's still several more, but they're really similar. And so like week four, I did a video of me doing um, this third one right here, you know, and so these can be really helpful for you. And so if you're wanting to work ahead, um, these won't be available to you if you're wanting to work ahead, um, but these are unlocked right now. So, and then other videos that have been helpful over time, um, they're not locked either. If you wanted to start looking at the developer tools, I have three videos right here on those, kind of organized by week as to when they might be more pertinent to you. Um, and then a bunch of other things, like if you don't know how to use iLearn or, um, you know, how, how we're going to use Slack in the course, um, some good tips for VS Code, you know, just things that are helpful for you uh, if you'd like. So that's our video spreadsheet. And then Google Help Channel, Tutoring Center, uh, our class TAs. So this right here is just about Nicholas and how he's doing the grading for the course. I'm going to put in the other two TAs in here as well so that you can just message them directly. Um, like we said earlier, they are Jenny and Marvel for our TAs. Uh, you can set up an appointment with me. Uh, here's my link. This will just throw an appointment straight onto my calendar. Um, if there's nothing available on there, it's because there's stuff already on my calendar and you just have to go further out. Um, and then for general support, like if you're not seeing iLearn in your course or something like that, uh, you can contact the online support center or the IT help desk. So, all right, so that's there for you. And that's pretty much it with the syllabus. I mean, in here, I talk about plagiarism. I talk about some other policies of the university and these should be pretty, pretty familiar to you. Um, with that said, as people start programming for their first time, um, it's interesting because you can find programming, you can find code all over the internet that you can get help with, you know? And so right here, I just say, hey, if you use it, if you use code from somewhere else, just like you would in an English paper, you know, just put a link uh, or just put a comment into your code that says, hey, I've grabbed these lines of code from whatever source um, so that you're not claiming somebody else's code as your own, so. All right, you guys, any questions on the syllabus? Well then, I think we're ready to dive into our chapter. Looks like we have 20 minutes to do it. Uh, looking at week one, the only thing I wanna give a shout out to, um, just be familiar with the syllabus, make sure you have all the, the software installed that we talked about today. Um, this getting to know you discussion report, all you have to do for this is go into Slack, post your introduction, um, just follow these instructions and then you'll just come here and click yes for the quiz question that said that you did it. So, um, and respond to at least four, uh, just so we can all get to know each other. Uh, let's see, chapter one review. This is really common, just having a review quiz after each chapter, you'll have one for every single chapter that we read. Um, and then a self-assessment survey. And this, you'll have one of these every week too, and that's just kind of a self-reporting thing as well. So. Okay, so without any further ado, we just talked about week one deliverables, chapter one, computer hardware. All right, so changing gears. Now we're actually gonna talk about computer stuff and not class stuff. So computer hardware. Um, the reason why we're talking about computer hardware in a programming class is because it's important to understand how our computer works. Now, with that said, I very rarely, if ever, think about semiconductors in my computer. I've never built a computer. I have very little desire to ever build a computer. I enjoy working with software on a computer. But the reason why we talk about this is so that you at least understand how a computer works. So that as you write software, you understand how it's actually working and it's not just some like magical, mystical thing that your computer does, okay? So there are parts in the computer that we're gonna talk about. There are parts that we're not gonna talk about. We're just gonna go over the very basics because this is a programming class. And so week one, we talk about hardware in a computer and then we'll never touch it again, except for your exams, so. All right, so uh, microscopic parts of a computer that partially conduct or sometimes conduct electricity. There are five main, five main types of semiconductors, capacitor, diode, LED, resistor, and transistor, okay? There are these right here. Um, some of these look familiar. I'm pretty sure we've all seen some type of LED before in our lifetimes, um, but these are all used inside computers to basically say, yes, we're gonna let electricity go into this part of the computer, or no, we're not going to. An integrated circuit is composed of usually billions with most computers that are purchased nowadays. 
billions of semiconductors etched on a small piece of silicone, sometimes called a computer chip. Okay, so billions, you can't even see them, just different things in here to say, all right, we're gonna let electricity through here or we're not going to. All right, has anyone ever heard of binary? What, what is binary? Do you guys know what binary is? That sounds familiar, but I am not remembering what it is off the top of my head. Good. Go ahead, Isn't it ones and zeros that are used to represent English characters or other characters? Yes, you're exactly right. So ones and zeros. Uh, I would be so bold as to call our computers kind of dumb. Okay, there are billions of pieces right here, uh, which sounds really intense. But our computers in and of themselves are not capable of thought or actually computing anything. They're not even capable of like storing something like a video. No, what they store are ones and zeros, okay? And this is either just as far as memory goes, it's just, you know, you'll either have ones or zeros stored to say, yes, this is true or no, it's not. If you think about a semiconductor, it's either allowing electricity to flow through it or it's not, true or false. You know, and so like Samuel said, if I wanted to store the letter A somewhere in my computer, that letter A at some point is going to be converted into machine code and then into binary code to actually be stored in my computer. So an A might look like 1001 or something like that. I actually have no idea what it is, but we could Google it, be like A to binary, and then you would see what the binary code for A is. And that's how it is with every single character that we have. It, and even like a video, you know, if I was going to save a video on my computer or a picture, you know, every single pixel that's stored in a picture will have a color code. That's a number, probably like a six digit number. And that six digit number will get converted into binary at some point in the computer. And you'll have like thousands and thousands of pixels for a single picture, you know? And so really our computer at the baseline works with binary all the time, just zeros and ones, true or false. And so when we're talking about like semiconductors, you know, that's why there's like billions of, of, of these semiconductors in here to control the flow of electricity, because that's how our computer registers binary, zeros or ones, true or false. It's like, is there electricity flowing here? True or false, you know? And that's, that's all it can do, because computers are actually really simple in that regard. So parts of a computer, you guys have probably heard of a couple of these. Uh, power supply, keyboard, mouse, monitor, motherboard, bus, BIOS, main memory, hard drive, CD or drug drive, or DVD drive, uh, CPU and cache. And uh, all of these, you're probably familiar with the majority of them. Uh, the power supply, obviously either just plug it into a wall or a battery for like a laptop or something. Keyboard and mouse are used for inputs. We have a lot of other things that are used for inputs. Right now I'm using my microphone and my camera that are also using input from the user for my computer. Uh, for output, uh, we have things like speakers, monitors. Uh, those are all way to have output from a computer. Our motherboard is kind of like the hood of a car. Okay, it's kind of where everything is. It has the engine and it also has where I need to fill up my windshield wiper fluid. Okay, the motherboard is where everything kind of attaches to um, a computer. So right here, this is just a CD or DVD drive. Um, that is detached from my computer, but if I wanted to plug it into my computer, I just have to plug in these USB ports or these USB cables, and that attaches to the motherboard of my computer, okay? Um, and this is what we call a peripheral, right? If I have a jump or thumb drive, um, that's another thing. I just plug it into a USB, and that is a peripheral. I could think about my external monitors that I have as peripherals of my computer, as things that attach to uh, my motherboard and end up expanding the um, the functionality of my computer. Uh, the bus, you'll see, if we look back at this picture right here, um, these lines right here are buses. That's something that we actually can see. Uh, the bus is just used to transfer uh, data or electrical currents um, in a computer. So if I clicked with my mouse, um, somewhere in my computer that's gonna go along a bus to say, hey, this was clicked, it's gonna to go to the CPU or, or, or where that's gonna be processed, um, but the bus is used to transfer data. We have the BIOS. The BIOS is a piece of software that is most integrated to the hardware, okay? Um, and that BIOS is what happens, is what runs when the computer is first turned on. 
as soon as power goes into the computer that was previously not powered, the BIOS is the first piece of software that runs that says what operating system it's going to boot um, and different um, initialization settings. Uh, main memory, usually we, ju we just say RAM, random access memory, uh, but random access memory is a type of main memory, the most common type of main memory. And that is a very temporal, volatile state of memory uh, that's used to store things temporarily. So right now I have Zoom open on my computer, I have Google Chrome open up on my computer, and that is utilizing my RAM or my main memory to be able to run these programs while I need them to run. Okay, then I have my hard drive. I have all these files on my computer and all these other programs that aren't being used right now that are on my hard drive. And if I wanted to use them, I would just click on it and uh, it, would, it would actually copy that file into my main memory so that, it could, so that it could use it. Okay, we have the CPU, the central processing unit where all the processing happens inside the computer. And then we have the cache, which is very similar to RAM. It's a different type of temporary memory primarily used for storing data of programs while the programs are running. Uh, data sizes, uh, we've all heard of megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes probably, uh, but there are a lot bigger ones and there are a lot smaller ones. So a bit is a binary digit, a zero or one. We've already talked about binary. So that is a single bit, it's either a zero or one. A nibble is four bits joined together, a byte is eight, a kilobyte is a roughly a thousand, it's 1,024 bytes. Uh, a megabyte is two to, to the twentieth bytes, so it's roughly a million kilobytes. Uh, a gigabyte is, is roughly a million megabytes, and it just keeps on going up. Okay. Uh, clock speeds. So a clock within a CPU is a small electrical circuit that repeatedly produces an electric signal, signal that pulses. A signal core on a, a single core on a CPU is designed to complete one instruction at the end of each pulse. All right, so if you imagine, let's just say I have a clock and every time it hits like the second hand, I'm gonna do something, okay? Um, and so a clock speed is measured in the following of hertz, megahertz, and gigahertz. Uh, many modern computers have clock speeds of 2.5 gigahertz or higher, okay? So a gigahertz is able to pulse 1 billion times per second, which is mind blowing to me, okay? But that's how, that's what a gigahertz is. And so our CPU is, able to take that and every single time it pulses 1 billion times per second, it is able to do something. Now, this isn't to be confused with the amount of stuff that it can do in that time frame. Okay, that might be like moving a single bit. Okay, if I take, um, let's say a large MP4 file on my computer, I'm like, I'm going to move it from my desktop to my, my documents or my videos or something. I'm moving it to a different place on my computer. Okay, that clock speed will continue running maybe at 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, so two and a half billion cycles per second, but it can't grab the entire video and move it all at once. It's only capable, capable of moving tiny fragments of it. And that's why it takes a long time. And we see that like little progress bar going because it takes a long time. So um, this question right here, how many instructions per second would a 2.5 gigahertz quad core CPU be able to execute? So if we have 2.5 gigahertz and each gigahertz is 1 billion, that's two and a half billion per core, and then 10 billion for the four cores, that, that quad core CPU. And so as you're looking at computers, um, and you're looking at processors of computers, uh, you can kind of get a feel for how, how quickly they work uh, based on the number of gigahertz and the number of cores um, in the CPU. Uh, common classes of computers, we have micro or personal, it's probably what we are all using today. Um, basic laptops, uh, cell phones, smartwatches, these are all micro or personal computers, uh, tablets as well. Um, some laptops are workstations, are classified as workstations. Uh, usually they'll have at least 32 gigs of RAM and they'll have just a lot of processing power. They'll have a really powerful CPU. Uh, but a workstation is a powerful computer designed to be used by one person at a time, at a time. So it could be a laptop or a large desktop, uh, used to perform engineering, scientific, and medical tasks. Um, designing an airplane, even some, um, a lot of data analytics software is just, it's on a computer just to be used by one person, but it's really, really heavy software. It needs a lot of computing power. Then we have a mainframe, a very powerful computer designed to be used by many people at the same time to, to perform business or scientific tasks. Um, 
And so you could think of a mainframe even as, um, Samuel, I know you were in CS124, like you think of the Linux lab, we'd all connect to that Linux lab at the same time. You know, it's designed to be used by a lot of different people at the same time. Um, generally for business or scientific tasks, uh, but it could be for, for a lot of other things as well. A question on that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to ask you after class, but you brought it up. So are we only using Visual Studio Code then? We're not using MOBA? Are we using both? No MOBA. No Linux connections. That's, that's gone. That's gone. Yeah. Okay. So as long as we have Visual Studio Code, we'll be able to submit our assignments correctly. Yep. I like okay. I said, if you wanted to use Sublime or Notepad++ or even Notepad, you technically could. Like when you submit your assignments, you're just using the text editor to write your code. It's like me saying, I'm going to use Microsoft Word instead of Google Docs. You know, it yeah. doesn't once it's submitted. So you can technically use anything you want, but like I said, I'll be using VS Code. So. Okay, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So types of software. Hardware won't do anything without some instruction. We already talked about the BIOS. That is a type of software, the one that runs as soon as a computer is turned on. Uh, we also have an operating system. So once that BIOS runs, it's going to look for an operating system. It's going to look for a configuration file that says which operating system to boot. You could technically have multiple OSs installed on a computer and can configure in your BIOS which one you want to boot. But the operating system manages the hardware and it isolates applications from the hardware. So I look at Google Chrome. I could run that in, on pretty much any OS that I know of anyways. You know, I could run it on a Mac. I could run it on Windows. I could run it on a Linux distribution, you know, I run on my Android device. So um, the operating system makes it so that when software developers like us need to write a program, we can just write a program and we don't have to worry about how many gigahertz our, our, our CPU spitting out. Uh, an application is software that someone uses to accomplish a specific task. Okay. Uh, right now I have Microsoft Teams open and Zoom and Chrome and uh, VS Code and Slack. These are all applications inside of my operating system that all perform a specific task. Uh, character data. So when I, when, when I don't want to go too far to this, we already talked a little bit about binary, uh, but my name right here, Birch and Birch, uh, every single letter has uh, an ASCII code, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And then this code, when it's sent to the, com sent to the computer, 98.105.114, uh, these will also get turned into binary. So I'm only putting this in here so that you guys understand that, you know, when you want to save a variable or a piece of data in your computer or even a file, you know, um, it's not being stored exactly how you see it, uh, but it will go through a number of conversions to go from um, what you see to ASCII or Unicode and then onto machine code and binary. So execution example, a user clicks on a Microsoft Word document. Let's say I have a link to a Microsoft Word document on my desktop. I click on it. Here's what's going to happen. The operating system commands a hard drive to copy Microsoft Word itself into main memory. I can't open up an application from the hard drive. It has to be in main memory, in RAM, for me to actually use that application. The hard drive then listens and it copies Microsoft Word over a bus into main memory, into RAM. After it's there, the OS executes Microsoft Word and sends a command to Word telling it to open the document that the user clicked. Microsoft then listens and requests the operating system to read the document from the hard drive and to place that as well, the document, into main memory. So again, I can't just read a document that's sitting in the hard drive. It has to be in RAM. So you, when you look at a computer that you want to buy and you're like, oh, well, I don't need more than two gigs of RAM. Well, you probably will, or at least you'll want more than two gigs of RAM. Okay, because then you can have a bunch of stuff open at the same time and it just helps with life and happiness. Um, I'm just kidding. The operating system commands the hard drive to copy the document file into main memory. The hard drive copies the document file over a bus into main memory. So now in main memory, we have the application Microsoft Word, we have the file, and Microsoft knows that it needs to open up the file. Then for every single character that is in the document, every character, Microsoft reads the character's Unicode number from main memory and requests the operating system to draw that character in a window. The operating system then listens, finds the Unicode number and its corresponding symbol in a table and draws that symbol. Okay. So there's a lot going on here. Now, like I said, I never worry about any of this until the first week of every semester when I have to teach you guys. But outside of that, I'm like, you know what? All I have to do is write my code. This stuff works. I know a little bit of how it works. I don't have to know everything. Okay. 
All I have to know is that I have a text editor that I can write code with. It's saved to my hard drive. I can access it from there. I can run it. Um, if I want to run a bunch of files at the same time, I need a computer with more RAM, you know? And so really, I just want you guys to understand the very basics, just what I said of how a computer works. And then for every single week from the, for the rest of the semester, we're just going to be writing code. So any questions on this? Okay. Well, that was all I had for you guys today. So um, I did record the last 30 ish minutes of this class. If anyone wants to see it, which was like the chapter. So if you had questions about the chapter, at least that'll be recorded. Um, Fly is getting spotted with rubber bands won't be recorded. It's probably for the best. So uh, anyways, it's, it's been an absolute, an absolute pleasure seeing you guys and getting to know you guys a little bit. And uh, I'm excited for the semester. So. Oh, the last thing, sorry, before I let you guys go, student interviews. Uh, I sent this out. This is completely optional. Um, but please, please do sign up for a time. They're only 10 minutes. I'd love to talk to you, get to know you a little bit. If you have questions about classes, majors, careers, programming languages, um, rubber band shooting techniques, whatever you have questions about, I'm here for you. So um, please do sign up for a time. So, okay. All right. Well, if anyone wants to stick around for questions, I can answer questions for a few minutes. I'll go ahead and stop the recording and I'll plan on talking to you guys throughout the week and seeing you guys next week. I had a quick question. So with um, not having MOBA now, how do we, um, is there like, can we through Visual Studio Code, like check our coding, um, like run through it, making sure it actually works? Can you still see my screen or did I just stop that? No, I can still see your screen. Okay. So let me show you how that, wait, that, how that works. Um, let's see here. Because I'm taking two courses that require Visual Studio Code, so I'm probably good to know this. Okay. So here is, in week three, is when you're going to start uh, learning HTML. Okay. Week one is computer yeah. hardware. Week two is algorithms. And week three, we learn HTML. This is HTML. Basically, all it is, you just have a series of tags. These are called tags. And um, each tag will have some attributes, values for those attributes. And then when you run this, you need to run it in a program that understands how to read an HTML document. If I have a Word X file or a docx file on my computer, I can't open that up with uh, like a media player. I have to open yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, it has to have the correct well, way to open it. Yeah. And so on these programs, if I copy the file path, which I can just right click up here and hit copy path, uh, the program that reads HTML files the best is your browser, okay? Um, and that, that's like what every website is that you look at. They're all HTML websites. And so I can take- What's that website again? The, this is the file path on my computer. This is on my system. Okay, so you just copy path. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So we, we can actually practice real quick. Um, I'm just going to hit Control N for a new file. And there's a cool little shortcut in here. Uh, let's see if that works. That doesn't work. So I'm going to hit save and I'm just going to say this is my desktop because it's temporary and I'm going to say um, practice and I'm going to say dot HTML. If I don't say dot HTML or select HTML out of this list here, this won't work. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to say, save this as an HTML file. It should show up as practice.html up here. Okay, now a little shortcut in VS Code, if I hit this exclamation mark and hit tab, then it'll kind of give me this template for HTML. Okay. okay. That's, that, this is like everything that I need for it to run. Now, if I ran this right now, let me copy the file path and come over here. I'm going to open up a new tab, paste it. Look at this. Users, birds, desktop, practice.html. It's just the file on my computer. Hit enter. There's nothing here, but look at this. Document showing up here. That's the title. Mm. Okay. Okay. And the head is where like the settings for my HTML file are, including the title, what will show up in the tab in my browser. Okay. So if I change this to awesome document and saved it, come over here, hit refresh. That'll be the title. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now in here, I could add all sorts of stuff. Okay. And you'll learn about these, a lot of these tags 
in week three, but I could have a header that says. I took uh, the web design development WDD 130 yeah. last semester. So I, I understand most of the basics for this, but I was just like, all right, we're not using MOBA. What am I? <laughs> I don't even make sure things work. Um, yeah. In your browser. So. Awesome. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad to be back in your classes. Is your finger okay? Yeah, my finger is okay. Okay. Yeah, I had a, an unpleasant encounter with a table saw, but I still have a finger, so it could go good. Out. I can't even tie my tie. I still, I, I still have like these fingers, so. Really That's great. good. Well, I'll uh, see you next. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. I signed up for one of your things, but then, yeah, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Samuel. Okay, is everyone else, else here? Do you guys have any more questions? I actually had a question about um, one of the questions that is in the textbook. Oh. Let's see. Go ahead and go ahead and read it off. What's your question? Well, let me get to it first. <clears throat> um, it was talking about. Um, Here we go. Uh, it says match each of the following types of computer memory with the physical quantity that each manipulates to store data. I'm, while I was reading through the textbook part, it, I can understand what the physical quantity each one manipulated. Hmm. I actually don't know this off the top of my head either. I'm trying to think. Uh, light before flash memory and the DVD drive. Magnetization, I think, is the hard drive, and electric charge, I think, would be main memory and cache. But I, I would have to Google it to know for sure. Okay, it just didn't state that clearly in the in yeah. the textbook. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress that too much. I don't know it because we never talk about it in this class, like. Um, I, I can look at your exam, and, and if it comes up on your exam, then I'll let you know beforehand. But I think you should be good. Okay. But I'm pretty sure what I just said is, is accurate, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, well you guys, it's been a pleasure. I will talk to you throughout the week and see you next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a good one. Another bridge before we leave. Um, I don't think you finished stop recording. I think it's still recording. Sweet. I'll stop it right now. Okay. Okay. Have a good one. Okay. And quick question. Tomorrow, you said we're meeting at 9.30 in the morning? Or no, 8.30?